Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And my guests today are Kim and Barry Jones, and our topic is human trafficking. And we're just going to dive right in. And, and my simple question for you, Kim, is how does a suburban wife like you end up working in an area like this? How did you, how did you come to, to spend time in human trafficking? That is a great question. I have asked myself that a million times, I think, even when I stood in the middle of a red light district, I'll never forget thinking, I'm a homeschooling mom at this point, and here I am standing. What am I doing here? But it actually started about seven years ago, and I was uh, watching an interview that Ashley Judd was doing with Madeline Albright. Uh, and in that interview, they mentioned two words that I had never heard of, and they were human trafficking. And of course, um, how does m- a great you know user of the internet respond? Mm-hmm. We of course Google it, right? <laughs> right? So I went and I Googled human trafficking, and um, and was astounded by what I started to find. Mm. Um, from there, I read probably one of the best books. It's it's not a book of faith necessarily. It's called A Crime So Monstrous. Mm-hmm. It took me a long time to get through it, mm-hmm. but it was a fantastic read, and it gave me a great understanding of what was happening worldwide. Um, and, uh, and so it just captured my imagination, if you will. It captured um, my mind, it opened my eyes, and I realized, okay, now I know, and so I have to respond. Mm. And so it just went from there, and it was a ball that has not stopped rolling. <laughs> 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 just gathering steam. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, so tell us what it is that you do, since I, did, since I didn't tell everyone what oh, you do. But that's okay. Yeah. Um, I work for an organization called My Refuge House. We mm-hmm. are an aftercare home for mm-hmm. girls who have been rescued from sex trafficking. Mm-hmm. Um, we're located in Cebu, Philippines, mm. and um, it's a great Great, great um, organization. Um, I can't say this enough. Every time I talk about it um, and talk about our girls, um, Mm -hmm. I just smile ear to ear because it it is truly a delight. Um, Basically, I am their arm here in the U.S. in terms of education, Mm -hmm. um, providing education um, about what we do, but then not just about what we do, but just educating, bringing awareness to the issue. I'm often astounded, and I shouldn't be, but I find myself astounded in that there are still people that don't know. Mm-hmm. And um, and so that's why I'm here. I, mm-hmm. I provide that knowledge for people and really just talk to people about the kind of work that we do with our girls um, there in the Philippines. Now, Barry, you've kind of been along for the ride on this. Very so, much so. So, how, what's what's it like to be a husband of a suburban wife? Who, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, it's been really interesting, Daryl, because you know I I teach here at the seminary. Mm-hmm. I'm a pastor, uh, teaching pastor in a local church, and so I get lots of opportunities to open up the scriptures to talk about God's heart for justice, for um, the call for us to be shalom makers. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it's it's fun for me to be able to. To sort of point to my wife as a very living example of that. Mm-hmm. That it's one thing for me to stand in front of my congregation and talk about it. It's another thing to to take Kim to the airport to put her on a, a plane to fly to the Philippines or to fly to to Thailand or Cambodia, the places that she's been, um, where she's seen these things on the ground and are in, encountering these lives. Uh, up close and personal. And so it's been a huge inspiration for me to be able to hear the stories that she brings back um, from these experiences that she's having. And uh, I think in a lot of ways it has made me uh, better understand God's heart for justice, better understand the call to us to be people who um, – are signs and foretastes of the world that is to come. As I as I watch my wife live that stuff out in really profound ways, um, seeing that light shining amidst a very very dark kind of backdrop, um, 
it's uh, it's not only personally been insp- inspiring for me, but also I think has more deeply informed the way that I teach my students here at the seminary, the way I, I teach my congregation in the local church. But I very much have been the guy who's you know carrying suitcases and driving her to the airport, or, uh-huh. or uh, you know helping watch kids while she's off telling stories about the the, 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 the things that are happening in this area. So the, your main um, contact deals with the international. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, sex trade area. We've had Mike Bartell uh, do the show in which he's concentrated on what's going on in the United States because most people think, oh, that is, if they're aware of it, they think it's just strictly an international problem. And of course it isn't. You know, this is funny because my awareness of this area is related to uh, a missions conference, an international missions conference that I went to Mm -hmm. in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And when we landed in Bangkok, they said, well, we're going to go to a church meeting today. And I thought, okay, this is going to be your normal missionary, you know, uh, this is what the church is doing kind of thing. And it was, this is what the church is doing. But what the church was doing was dealing with human sex trafficking Mm -hmm. and trying to help uh, rescue women out of it and that kind of thing. So, you know, and we hadn't been told ahead of time what the topic was going to be. And so they dropped us in this in this meeting and we're, you know, we're expecting, you know, a few rounds of amazing grace, et cetera, and we're off and running mm-hmm. talking about, mm-hmm. you know, evangelism and that kind of thing and and boom, this is what what uh, mm-hmm. what hit us. And so so that's that uh, my experience is, is kind of similar to yours in terms of, of awareness of this area. So let's talk about um, uh, uh, international sex trade a little bit and kind of what you're dealing with, where the girls that you're talking about okay. come out of. Um, how common is it? What are the ages that we're talking okay. about? That kind of thing. Okay. Um, well, first of all, they are approximately uh, – and. and <laughs> I'm not a big numbers person because numbers can be manipulated, right? Right. right. But to give people an understanding of what we're dealing with, there's approximately 20.9 million people throughout the world that are enslaved. Hmm. Um, and two thirds of that number are in the Asia Pacific area. Mm-hmm. And then when you kind of then focus in specifically on the Philippines, um, we're looking at approximately 100,000 children each year. Mm. Um, We, like I said earlier, deal with sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. Um, Our girls range – I mean, it could be – we would take girls at any age, mm-hmm. um, as and some can be as young as you know three and four. We've never taken any that young, but mm-hmm. I do know of organizations that have. Currently, our girls are between the ages of eleven and nineteen, mm. um, and a lot of them have stories of manipulation, fraud, coercion. Mm-hmm. Um, they find themselves in circumstances. Um, that they would never have imagined themselves in, um, which is not unusual throughout the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, the stories that we hear in the Philippines are going to be very similar to stories that we hear in India or perhaps in Africa or here in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the central issues in the Philippines has a lot to do with poverty. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a huge issue of poverty there. And so when you are struggling to eat, or you're struggling to um, find clothing, um, you're, you name it, um, just the basic necessities, um, you're not – and I say this to people, and I think I, I, I get wide eyes from people in that, you never know what you might do. Mm-hmm. And they look at me as if, are you kidding me? And mm-hmm. But when your back is against the wall, mm-hmm. you're never sure, because we have parents who will sell their children. That was my next question. Yeah. yeah. We have parents who sell children, and so when you're living on the street and you're basically living on a um, a cardboard box, mm-hmm. and you have no means to make money and to survive, you find yourselves doing things that you never imagined yourself doing. So we have situations like that. We have situations where there is abuse in the home, where we have sexual abuse or physical abuse, and um, and it's it's sort of um, preparing them, if you will, in some ways. Um, it's setting them up. It's placing them at risk mm-hmm. for um, – for those that kind of come in, predators who come in and see that that 
that these kids are vulnerable. Many of our girls have had pimps basically come in and say, hey, I can give you a better life. Let's go to the city. They don't know they're a pimp. Mm -hmm. Um, But the the other thing that's really interesting about the Asian culture, specifically um, in regards to the the Filipino culture, is that children are actually expected to support their families. They're Mm -hmm. expected to support their parents at any age. Mm -hmm. And they, they get to a point where it they have to um, – they, they feel obligated. And children see that there's this – this they want to honor their parents. And mm-hmm. they'll do whatever they need to in order to take care of the family. And sometimes they find themselves, hey, I'll go to the city because there's, there's a job for me at a hotel. Mm-hmm. And what they don't realize is that they have just been uh, manipulated. They've been – it's fraudulent. It's not true. They're and then trapped. They, yeah, they're entrapped. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's where a lot of our girls are coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a lot to do with the cycle of, of poverty. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got, um, as I mentioned, we've had Mike Bartell on here, and he said something to the effect of there were there's something like only 200 dedicated beds to help mm-hmm. girls mm-hmm. pulling out of sex trafficking in the United States, and of course you're dealing with thousands. So I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's you know nothing compared to the need right. um, how many how many beds are you dealing with uh, in in the Philippines and uh, is the situation similar in international yeah you know we have there are how can I say this there are places that you would want children to go mm-hmm. um, and then there are places that are not necessarily providing the holistic care that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's places that they can go temporarily, if you will, but there's just a smattering. There's not that many, um, because there's so many islands. Mm-hmm. There's over 7,000 islands in the Philippines. So you've got such a diverse group, mm-hmm. such a spread out group of, of people, but they're, they're more there's a larger need mm-hmm. than um, than we actually are capable of of meeting. Um, we are the one um, home in Cebu, mm-hmm. and we actually can hold up to twenty girls. Mm-hmm. Um, the The one thing that we are very careful about is that our property could perhaps hold more, mm-hmm. but if we want to see real restoration mm-hmm. happen, mm-hmm. then we have to limit the amount of mm-hmm. girls that we have because mm-hmm. otherwise, then we are we're not helping them ultimately. Yes, we may be getting them off the street, Mm -hmm. but are we actually helping to deal with them emotionally, socially, psychologically, spiritually? Because that, in order to really deal with the issues that these girls are facing, Mm -hmm. they have to be seen as a whole person. They have to be dealt with holistically. And it takes a long time to go through all that because of the depth of the damage that's been done. Exactly, exactly. Now, um, uh, another uh, another question that comes up in relationship to this: So, you, you do the girls in in the United States? What what was happening oftentimes is is that not only do you have to rescue someone out of the situation that they're in, but you actually have to relocate them to some degree yeah. to get them away from being re re entrapped, if right. I can say it that right. way. Mm-hmm. And so, is are those dynamics the same in the Philippines? Um, or are they different? What we do, it, there's some similarities, mm-hmm. um, but. We actually partner with International Justice Mission there in Cebu. Mm -hmm. And so IGM, what they do is they go in and they are there to help law enforcement Mm -hmm. to help them um, do some of the necessary groundwork on helping to locate girls. Um, We work very closely with the law enforcement. Um, It's essential to have that partnership Mm -hmm. and for us to encourage them to actually um, identify these girls. and so we've got a great, um, a great relationship in in those kinds of ways. Um, and then once they are rescued, then they then they come to us. We are located in an undisclosed area. Mm. We are we we don't give our address out, yeah, if you right, will. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so only a select few actually come to the to the space that we have. We have a twenty foot wall that surrounds our entire um, property. Mm. We have three. Um, Three security guards um, that cycle through throughout the day and the week. Um, we do have girls that are still being threatened um, by pimps. Um, we do have those kind of circumstances. 
Um, however, we also have circumstances where um, there isn't the threat. There mm -hmm. isn't that threat. And so what we've recognized is that we have to have a balance in that ult our ultimate desire is to reintegrate our girls, right. is to help them to reintegrate into their culture and to be um, – functioning, well-adjusted human beings. And um, and so the, the rub, if you will, is the 20-foot wall, and we can't always protect them. It, it kind of reminds me as a parent, as, you know, my kids, mm -hmm. I want to keep them to me. I want to mm -hmm. protect them from the world. But ultimately, that may do more harm than, than good. Mm -hmm. And so what we've recognized and, um, and that we do is, is for the girls who are not – at risk for those kinds of things. Our goal is to reintegrate them with their families, is to bring healing to their families, is to really work on that unit. Um, it is essential in the Filipino culture. Um, the family is 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 the center. Mm -hmm. And in in order to function in society, that that has to be a really strong unit. Mm -hmm. And so for us, even when maybe um, there have been parents that have sold them, what we try to do is find someone in their family mm -hmm. that we are able to connect them with, mm -hmm. that we are continuing to create those um, those connections and um, and firming those up and shoring those up. And uh, yeah, we we don't want. Um, our girls to be afraid of the world, and qu and quite frankly, they're not. They're mm. the most courageous girls. Mm. They are, they are the sweetest, most joyful, but tough girls. Mm. Like they, uh, you know, what they've the experienced. You have to, and they just have such a. They're just gumption. I mean, they just, mm -hmm. they're so, we have one girl right now going to university, and she said, well, you know, I'm going to university because I'm going to become a cop. Mm. And I said, oh, you're going to become a cop? Uh, yeah, I'm coming to cop because I'm going to go out and I'm going to arrest them. And sure enough, because she has that mm. thing in mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. that says, this is what I'm going to do. Mm. So... I, that was kind of a roundabout way to answer your question. Yeah. We, we, yes, we have to protect them. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do create a, s a situation where it's a safe um, harbor um, facility. But then, yet at the same time, recognizing there has to be flexibility in that um, because not all um, situations are exactly the same. Now, Barry, you, you know, uh, we've kind of had set this up as you're kind of on the sidelines <laughs> watching all this happen, but I know that something like this doesn't happen without uh, the spouse cooperating. Sure. So what what's involved from your end in terms of in terms of what goes on. Yeah, well, I think a couple of ways in that which that plays out. I mean, one of the things that we talk about as a family quite a bit is, um, you know, I I preach, I'm on pastoral staff at Irving Bible Church, and so um, when I have responsibilities and obligations um, there, and, and Kim takes on a greater weight uh, with our children and the family, she, in a sense, is ministering to all the people at Irving Bible Church by helping me to be free to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And we do that in a very reciprocal sort of way. So I'm taking the additional responsibilities with the with the family, with the kids, to free her up to be able to pursue this work that God has entrusted her to do. And I think it's a great way even to show our kids that, that sense of both mom and dad have gifts and callings and uh, support each other in this sort of way. And um, But the other thing, then, is in my pastoral role at the church um, – that we have partnered with My Refuge House. And so um, IBC has had a, a connection with this organization even before Kim actually came on staff with them. Hmm. She made a trip over there. Her first trip to the Philippines uh, was as a representative of Irving Bible Church hmm. uh, to go and then see the work that, we were, that was happening and the, the things that we were giving funds to and supporting. Um, and so we want to help our congregation to have a sense of what God is up to on the other side of the world uh, in the lives of these little girls um, and to help them to feel some sense of their participation as a community. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do as a church is um, – give the money to build a, a second cottage. There was kind of the main house where the girls were living, and so we were able to, to raise the funds and give to build a second cottage to be able to have more girls there at the facility. And then even more recently, um, when the church, we, we um, got out of debt, we had a large debt that we were trying to get out from under with the dream of saying, what can we as a church do with the money right now we're spending on building debt? What can we 
do for for ministry purposes, for kingdom purposes. And one of the first things we did when we got out of debt, we weren't sending that money to the bank every month, Mm -hmm. is we cut a check to my refuge house for Mm -hmm. them to build a pavilion, which is the place now where the girls will do all their education, all Mm -hmm. their social activities, just a place for them to to be together and to to enjoy a a kind of social space there on the property. And so those are all things that... that, um, that Kim is able to go and see firsthand and then come back to the congregation and tell the people. We're showing pictures. We're telling stories, telling stories of the girls, of individual lives that we're seeing changed because of our church's partnership with this organization. And Kim functions in a lot of ways as a go-between. And then I have the opportunity to sort of stand up and, 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 and preach and use these stories even in my sermons. So so your children are how old? <laughs> <laughs> 13, uh-huh. um, 13-year-old son, uh-huh. 10-year-old son, and a 6-year-old little girl. Now, obvious question is, <laughs> uh, um, how, how, do, how do you communicate this to them? We're, we're going to have to watch our time as we answer okay. this, but uh, how do you communicate this to them, and what has it been like for them to watch you know, mom and dad go after yeah. this? Um, our 13-year-old knows. Mm-hmm. Um, he, I don't go into great detail with mm-hmm. them, um, but he understands that the organization works with girls who are rescued from sex trafficking. Mm-hmm. The ten-year-old has a variation of that story. Mm-hmm. Um, it's we've rescued girls who are being sold. Now mm-hmm. that he's getting a little older, mm-hmm. um, he's pushing eleven now. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, he's he's beginning to um, kind of start to put things together. Mm-hmm. Our six-year-old, um, the way she put it to her kindergarten teacher was that mommy was going and telling people about Jesus oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. and, uh, and, and giving them a house. <laughs> That's kind of that. – so, so it varies according – you know, it's develop, whatever's developmentally appropriate. Right. And uh, so that's that's the way that we do it. And as they get older, they learn more. Mm-hmm. And and it's essential because I am an educator. Right. Um, it's essential for me to educate them about what it is that I do. Right. And that what we do here in the U.S. affects what people are doing halfway across the world. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it is through IBC and building or whether it is through – on the opposite, you know, the the flip side of that, men traveling across the you know across the continent mm-hmm. to buy a child, mm-hmm. or what we do here in the United States affects other people, mm-hmm. and I and I I want my kids to know that I want them to know and understand that that um, choices um, have far-reaching ramifications. And I think the first natural question to ask is, I'm a, I'm a church, I'm a pastor mm-hmm. listening to this, and I'm thinking about, yeah, that's a different kind of ministry than anything that we've ever done mm-hmm. before and contemplated. It seems kind of out there mm-hmm. to some degree, but on the other hand, it is a very concrete way of really ministering to people and, and really with an opportunity to really change the direction mm-hmm. of their lives. So how does that work, Barry? How, how did how did Irving how, how did uh, my initial question to Kim was, you know, how did a suburban sure. wife end up in this right. area? So how does a normal everyday church in the middle of America end up uh, going in this direction? Yeah, it's a, a great question. You know, I think sometimes what happens is we hear about this and it's just. Um, I mean, it's horrific to us to contemplate. Mm. And almost the natural impulse that arises in some people is like, okay, how can we go bust down the doors and, and pull these little girls out? And mm-hmm. of course, there's important work to be done in that regard. But for most of us, we're going to be pretty far removed from the, you know, kicking down the door and rescuing Yeah, some directly. of the experts I speak to talk about, you know, the danger of becoming a vigilante mm-hmm. and that that actually is mm-hmm. very, very destructive. Yes. Right. That's right. So, um, so that's not – so we know, we know we aren't going to go in all guns blazing. We can't right. follow that sort of impulse as yeah. much as we, yeah. we might want to. And so, um, you know, for us it's a matter of um, strategic partnerships and finding work that's already uh, been um, – begun that we can join in with. We had um, a personal relationship with Crystal Sprague, who's the former executive director of My Refuge House. She'd actually been involved in our church before as, mm. as a member. And so it was kind of through that personal relationship of finding out the work that Crystal was doing and then discovering a little bit more about 
of what the organization was all about and and um, and and you know what they needed and how we might be able to support them and so for us it was a matter of saying this is an important issue it's an issue that we want to be involved in and then beginning to look for what are some really meaningful ways that we can partner with existing organizations um, that are already doing good work. Of course, there's there's room for you know starting new NGOs and 501c3s, and I'm aware of some some new work that's being done. But there's also already some great existing organizations that mm-hmm. you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But maybe a church can say we're dedicated to responding to this issue. How can we partner with an organization that's already doing good work? And so at, at at IBC, we are partners with My Refuge House, and we support them financially. We're also involved with and, and have supported um, New Friends, New Life, which mm-hmm. is a local organization here in the Dallas area that helps women who are leaving the sex industry. And then in addition to that, um, you know, as Kim said, there's a lot of those sort of background factors of at-risk kids and poverty and, and, and education, many other things that are, um, that are the things that make um, – particularly young girls, although young boys as well, susceptible to this sort of thing. And so what are the ways that we might be able to strategically get involved with organizations that are part of that preventative type work? Um, Very important that we're rescuing girls and providing them this kind of holistic Mm -hmm. aftercare. But, oh, wouldn't it be beautiful for us to be able to have some kind of ability to, to intervene in the lives of these kind of children before they find themselves having been victimized in these kind of ways. And so as a church, we've also got some some different partnerships that we pursue with kind of organizations that deal with at-risk kids. And they don't always have to be directly related to human trafficking, right. this mm-hmm. at-risk type of organizations. I, I think for me, um, when the church asks the question, how do I get involved, my question is, have you – do you know your community? Mm-hmm. Do you know who's around you? Have you gotten involved in your local elementary school? Mm-hmm. And it, uh, local public elementary school, your local middle school, how are you connecting with them? How are you connecting with places where you know that there are youth involved in a way that the church can be proactive in um, in encouraging um, those groups of people? One of the things that IBC has done is uh, we have a reading buddy program mm-hmm. um, in the Irving ISD, and it has been remarkable. There have been people that have walked with kids, just simply lunch buddies, reading buddies, for years. Years. Mm-hmm. Now, whether or not that's actually quantified, like we can actually get numbers from that, there's no way. But what I do know is that lives are impacted. Mm-hmm. And we do know that when people are in relationship, in good, good, um, healthy relationships, then there are preventative things that are happening. Choices, right choices can be made. Um, so th- those, those are near and dear to my heart. I, I would also like to say something a little bit about my refuge house and the mm-hmm. way that we actually started. Mm -hmm. We um, were started by a small church Mm -hmm. that um, had been meeting for about 10 years in the L.A. area. And um, they decided to read a book called Terrify No More. And it's a book written by Gary Haugen, who is – he's the one who um, started IJM, International Justice Mission. And collectively, as a as a collective, um, I guess there were about two hundred people in the church at that time. Um, they all read it, and after they read it, they realized, "Wait a second, we have to respond. What do we mm-hmm. do?" And so they, this was, a, I guess, about nine years ago. And so they actually contacted IJM. And they said, hey, here we are. We're this group of people. We want to respond. What do we do? And IJM said, hey, listen, we are in Cebu, Philippines, and we are rescuing these kids, and they have nowhere to go. Hmm. They took that information. They began to pray. They began to fast. They began to just process, okay, God, how do you want us to respond? And out of that is how My Refuge House was was born. Now, the way that they paid for it was that they had been saving money for 10 years to build a building. Hmm. And instead of building the building, they chose to build My Refuge House. Hmm. And so when anybody ever asks, especially churches, like when I go and talk to churches and they go, well, we can't do anything, or I'm not sure if we could, or whatever, and I, th- I think, no, yes, you you can. This is a church. This small body of, of believers have changed over 
50 girls' lives. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is a, that's amazing, and they will they will change lives um, uh, in the future. And so, because they stepped out mm-hmm. in a very faithful, concrete kind of way, God is honoring that in a uh, such a beautiful way. So I, there is always <laughs> something mm-hmm. to do. Um, I love, um, you know, I, I love connecting with people and figuring out, okay, how are you wired? How, how mm-hmm. are you gifted? And figuring out, okay, so how does that fit in with this, this you know, this issue? And, um, and it's been really fun for me because one of the things that I do here in the States is I, I put on events. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, when you work for a nonprofit, you're a jack of all trades. Right, like, right, right. You know, um, and so, um, and uh, with that, I, I thought, you know, I want to do something creative. I want to connect with the artists of the world. I want to connect with the creatives of the world because that's a group that I'm not sure knows or feels like. How do I connect with this kind of thing? And so. Um, two years ago, I had this I, cra- – it's a crazy idea. I just have to say that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> a crazy idea to, to uh, put together an event that was a runway show. Mm. <laughs> and people kind of go, okay, so how is that helping human trafficking? Mm. Well, first of all, there are people that are get, have gotten involved in it that are not inside the church, mm-hmm. first of all. Second, people that are inside the church that have gifts that often go unused, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, the church doesn't necessarily see – maybe unseen gifts, mm-hmm. unseen talents, those kinds of things. And um, we have put together just a spectacular, beautiful event. We're doing it again, and it's been so – and I, I just, my heart just leaps literally when I see people using their gifts in order to bring restoration and rescue to our girls in my, at my refuge house. Because what they do here, whether it's they make a dress or they take pictures or they paint or they, you name it, um, they build a stage, that is benefiting the girls at my refuge house. Mm-hmm. It's all interrelated. It's all intertwined. And, and it's exciting to me. And that's what I tell people. I'm like, no, these gifts are good. This is good. You're not going and rescuing them, but you are doing something that rescues them. You now, know? here's here's a kind of <laughs> we we didn't talk about this yeah. in the first segment, but we probably should have. A girl comes to your home, to your house, mm-hmm. and and what what happens with them there? What what actually does the what services yeah. does the does the place provide? Well, the first thing ha- that happens when they come in is that most of our girls come in with STDs. Mm-hmm. So um, you know we'll have eleven year olds. We have four eleven year olds right now, and they come in with um, sexually transmitted diseases. So we have. Um, uh, gynecologists that work with us that they immediately get that addressed. They get all of their physical issues addressed. They get they go to the dentist. Mm-hmm. They get their eyes checked. Um, many of our girls, I would say probably 100% almost, mm-hmm. 99%, had never had their eyes checked. Mm-hmm. So we first of all deal with the physical needs, just those kinds of things. Um, one of the things you can definitely see in our girls that have just arrived and our girls that have been there for while you see a difference in their eyes. Mm -hmm. I know when I'm there who has just arrived. Um, Once they have uh, begun the process of of their medical, um, uh, then they begin to do education. They do assessments just to kind of find out. Most of our girls have less than a third grade education, Mm -hmm. less than that. And um, so they come in and And we teach actually in English because they really want to be bilingual, Mm -hmm. and actually it's 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 very beneficial to them um, ultimately. And in the Philippines, you see English everywhere, and it's it's very bilingual. Um, But then we also deal with them emotionally. They um, they have therapy. Um, We also have um, it's emotional, spiritual. We've. Oh my goodness! It is so um, it's so exciting to me to see them develop an understanding of what family could and should look like. Mm-hmm. I always leave and go, man, I need to do that in our family because they <laughs> they they are in family units mm-hmm. in cottages where six to eight girls stay and they have a house mother mm. and they we they meet weekly 
I mean, they're together all the yeah, time, yeah. but they even meet weekly to discuss what 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 went well this week mm-hmm. and what didn't. Mm-hmm. And I think, man, the Jones family needs mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's so neat because they're seeing and understanding how a family that is um, – how it can function well. Mm -hmm. And we're also helping to redefine what love should and could look like. So what's, I mean, this is probably a poor question, but what what's the average stay or length of stay that a girl has in the home? Is it is it very? I mean, yeah, it it really it really does. Um, I would say probably about two years, mm-hmm. maybe three. We've got some girls right now who have been there three years mm-hmm. and have just qualified for university, mm-hmm. um, and which we are ex- okay. That is beyond exciting to us. Like yeah, I yeah. literally want to jump up and down about it because they come in, like I said, with a third grade education, right. and um, and they are now three. I think we now have three more, so um, four, maybe five, that will be in university, hmm. and um, and it's exciting. They want to be writers. They want to be police officers. You prepared them for life. Yes, and it's exciting. They they'll say to us, "You have taught us to dream big dreams," mm-hmm. but not even just that. They. When I say that they are joyful, they have a joy. It's they understand who their father is. They get it. They understand it because they understand what rescue really means hmm. and what restoration really means. And um, and I'm all over the place, but it's it's just exciting to see. I see what is possible, and um, I see what what God is actually orchestrating. Okay, so we've looked at how the church does this, and we've we've talked about what happens to a girl that comes in the home and the and the length of time that this really does take to do mm-hmm. well. Yeah. Um, uh, the the one question that I think remains on the table is okay, uh, I'm I'm at stage one uh, as a person. This is interesting to me. Uh, how do I think about finding out about this? You've mentioned a couple of organizations. Maybe um, you said that you're about education. Where do people go to find out what's going on okay. and to even discover uh, what they might be able to do? Okay, there's a couple of great places. First of all, um, our um, Secretary of State, if you go to that page, there will be great information that the U.S. actually provides on every country in the world and where they stand. We have a four-tier system that we rate people, rate, excuse me, not people, but um, countries mm-hmm. on how they stand in the area of human trafficking. That's a great place to go. Your local um, government and uh, specifically state governments will have information on their websites mm-hmm. about how uh, – Human trafficking is being dealt with in their own state. So here's a use of tax dollars okay. we can actually be proud of. Yeah, right. right? Yeah. I know it's really great. Yeah. I, it's really great. Yeah. Um, Polaris Project. Mm-hmm. That's another great place to go. Um, uh, it, it, they give great information there as well. There are so many books. Like I said, Terrify No More by Gary Haugen. I highly recommend that. Um, there's even when you're wanting even young adults. And I say young adults um, like teen. Teenagers to learn more about it. They're so you're thinking about how ta- how you actually prepare your children exactly. for understanding what you're doing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a book called um, Sold, mm-hmm. and um, it it's a great book for um, for teenagers to read. Um, it, it's it's just really well done without getting into too much detail mm-hmm. in terms of what actually happens. Um, there, you know. Let me think. Um, even Love One Forty Six. That's another organization mm-hmm. that I love. That's um, near and dear to my heart. They they have a great web page. That um, their website has a lot of really good information. But beyond anything else, um, one of the things I would tell people, and this is this is where I think actually the church needs to work on too, mm-hmm. is having open communication in homes and in the church about sex. Mm-hmm. And that has to begin mm. with small children. Mm-hmm. That has to begin. We cannot be afraid. We cannot put, stick our head in the sand. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's really, I think, some of the place that has to begin as well. Um, education is essential in those areas. Reading is 
essential. Um, beyond that, once people start to re receive that information, then y you go tell, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we do as as, as believers. And, um, and the way that I always tell people that's the easiest way to tell what you have found Go to Facebook. Mm -hmm. T start putting things on Facebook. Tweet. Share it on Instagram. Um, it's non-threatening, mm -hmm. you know. Um, share it with your next door neighbors. That's that's the next pl that's the next step. After you have this knowledge, then share your knowledge. And and it it's really interesting because as you begin to do those kinds of things, doors begin to open whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I yeah. said, my this ball has been rolling. Yeah. Um, doors open whether you like it or not, and 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 you will find opportunities and love your neighbors. So if someone so. someone walks up to you and says, Kim, what do you do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, 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 and what happens next? That's always an awkward conversation. <laughs> yeah. And I always try to, to share it with a smile. Mm -hmm. um, but I just say I, I work with girls who've been rescued um, from trafficking, human trafficking. And um, and. I, I sometimes include sex trafficking, mm -hmm. but immediately um, when I, if I do use sex trafficking with them, their eyes sort of roll back in their head. Mm -hmm. However, I will say this: when the majority of the time, people are really interested. Well, you know, and I don't know if it's more for the sake of "Wow, what does that mean?" or mm -hmm. you know, or yeah. or for genuine interest. Mm -hmm. And I share, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, it's always kind of funny. And I try to use humor, mm -hmm. um, and I try to just really highlight that there is light mm -hmm. and that there is hope. Mm -hmm. And um, light has to be has to be shown because when people are confronted with such darkness, mm -hmm. they want to they they kind of want to put up blinders and they want to. Mm -hmm. They feel afraid. They feel fearful. And I say, do not, don't fear. Hmm. Do not fear. Now, Barry, what do you feel like you've, you've – this is a journey, a seven-year journey that we've been talking right. about. What do you feel like you've, you've learned and gained from, from watching your wife go through – um, really, uh, a tr uh, in some ways, a transformation Absolutely. in terms of how, how – I'm sure when she, when you all got married and said your original <laughs> vows, you didn't think this was going to be part of the right. part of the journey. Right, right. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been deeply personally impactful for me uh, on a number of levels. I mean, I, I mentioned before even the way I feel like it has enhanced my the, – the work that I do here with students and the work that I do in the local church by giving me some opportunities to talk about – um, the stories of these girls, I mean, telling their stories, um, uh, being able to, to share about what God is doing to bring restoration out of such pain, out of such brokenness, of such darkness. Um, so it's impacted my ministry, but, but I think the question you're asking is even deeper than that. Mm -hmm. How has it impacted me? And um, I would say that I think that, um, that, the, that the hope of the gospel has become so much more pronounced in some ways in my own life and in the life of our marriage and the life of our family because we're able to see that work of, of, um, of hope, of, uh, of rescue take place. Um, to see the darkness um, in the kinds of ways that Kim has, has seen it and then to see the transformation that comes in these girls' lives. These are, these are little girls who, who are so incredibly filled with joy. Kim's brought back videos of, of the girls dancing and singing and, um, and to see that joy that pervades their lives despite all that they've experienced um, really does cause you to sort of sit back and go, wow, um, the gospel is real. The gospel is powerful. The gospel brings life and hope and transformation and ought to bring joy to me. So you've seen compassion and mercy and, and care fleshed out in many ways. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. B.B. Um, uh, Warfield wrote a, a little essay called The Emotional Life of Our Lord, mm -hmm. and he looked at all the words that are used to describe the emotional disposition of Jesus. And so interesting to see that the single most frequently used word to describe the emotional disposition of Jesus is he has moved with compassion. Mm -hmm. And um, and to recognize that and then to see some of the realities that we've encountered and to see what is what is the compassion of Christ call forth from us in response to this um, has 
rearrange the way that I see gospel stories and the way I understand um, what God's up to in the world. Now, Kim, if there's one piece of advice that you could give to someone who's thinking about, okay, I've creeped out to the edge of the board, <laughs> I'm thinking about diving in, uh, what would it be? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Um, because I, I know what that, that feels like, and um, and God wants us to enter in. He wants us to dip our toes in. He wants us to put our foot in. He wants us to to move in that direction. Don't don't be afraid. But then at the same time, as you are um, having courage to enter into understanding this issue, as you develop a much more in depth understanding, the question is then to ask God, how is it that I can order my life? What can I do that um, will give me an opportunity to, um, to deal with the situation? And I, I, that, that's essential. That's essential is asking God, hey, God, how do you want to use me? Mm -hmm. I know now. Now what do you want me to do? And He's been really faithful to show you. I say that with the trepidation because <laughs> he will, but don't be afraid. And mm -hmm. I say that to people who are listening, but I say that even to myself. Mm -hmm. I have to remind myself, don't be afraid. You know, it's interesting when Paul was talking about uh, how to interact with, with people on the outside, he's thinking about sharing the gospel, and you think this is the Apostle Paul, he does this every day, no problem. Mm -hmm. He asked for prayer in mm -hmm. Colossians, mm -hmm. right. you know, mm -hmm. to be led and guided by the Spirit so you can have the capability and enablement mm -hmm. to do something that perhaps if you had thought about it initially, you said, I'm not sure I could do that. Mm -hmm. It's very much the way it is. Well, I want to thank you all for coming in and sharing this very important area with us and kind of giving us an overview of, of what it takes to get into it. It's an important area, and we're pleased mm -hmm. you could be with us. And we're pleased you could be with us on the table, and we look forward to having you back again. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.